Jai Swami Narayan. Today we are reading Karyani 3 of the Vachana Amrut. This passage is titled Shukmuni is a Great Sadhu. Semicolon, a person cannot be known by their superficial nature. Normally, I don't try to give context, or if I do, I try to be as non-biased as I can because I'm not qualified to give commentary, as this is the first time for me reading this also. That said, yesterday I did try recording this passage and my reading of, but I found myself unable to put into context some of the ideas in this passage that we'll read today. So i just like to warn you that there are some sensitive topics here and Bhagwan Swami Narayan is very direct with them. So understanding the time at which this was spoken and the context around him was very important. Nonetheless, I'll do my best again today. On the evening of Aso Vadhi VII, Samvat 1877, or the 28th of October, 1820, Sriji Maharaj was sitting facing north on a large decorated cot on the veranda outside the north-facing rooms of Vastak Hachar's Darbar in Karyani. He was wearing a white case and had tied a white feto around his head. He had also covered himself with a white cotton cloth. At that time, an assembly of Paramahansas as well as devotees from various places had gathered before him. One of the most beautiful things about the Swami Narayan tradition, and as is especially exemplified in the Vachana Amrut, is that context is always given at the beginning. So I'd just like to emphasize that he is speaking to Paramahansas, which are not just sadhus, but great sadhus. So oftentimes there is such a trust that has already developed that Sriji Maharaj is um, comfortable talking so directly with them. So in case any of the following verses kind of strike you as odd, just imagine that Sriji Maharaj is talking to someone they've known for a long time. Thereupon, Sriji Maharaj said, This Shukmuni is a very great sadhu. From the day he began staying with me, his enthusiasm has been ever increasing. In fact, it has never diminished. Thus, he is like Muktanand Swami. Sriji Maharaj then continued, The affection that people develop for each other is due to virtues, and the repulsion they experience for each other is due to faults. But those virtues and faults cannot be discerned from an individual's superficial behavior. Because, outwardly, a person may walk like a cat by fixing their eyes on the floor as they walk, but inside they may have intense lust. On seeing them behave in this manner, a person who is not wise might think, they are a very great sadhu. On the other hand, someone else may walk with wandering eyes. On seeing them, a person who is not my wise might think, they are a fake sadhu. Inwardly, however, they may be extremely free of lust. Thus, a person cannot be judged by their superficial physical behavior. Only after staying with them can they be judged. Because, by staying with them, their activities can be observed. The way they talk, the way they walk, the way they eat, the way they drink, the way they sleep, the way they wake, the way they sit, etc., also, the virtues and vices are more discernible during the period of youth, but they are not so obvious during childhood or during old age. Someone may be spoiled as a child, but as a youth they become virtuous. Conversely, someone may be good in their childhood, but become spoiled during their youth. A person who is determined in that, they feel, it is not good that I am having these base thoughts. And who makes an effort to eradicate those thoughts and who remains determined until they have been eradicated, progresses in their youth. On the other hand, one who is complacent instead of being alert will not progress. So a virtuous person like the former can be recognized from their childhood. 
Having said this, Sriji Maharaj talked at length about their own inclination for renunciation in their childhood. They continued, One who is virtuous does not like the company of immature children from their childhood. They do not have an appetite for tasty food, and they continuously restrain their body. Just look, when I was a child, I had the same thoughts as Kartik Swami, i.e., I felt, I want to eliminate all of the remnants of my mother, her flesh and blood, from my body. In the Swami Narayan tradition, it is common to renounce one's parents when they are becoming a monk. Householders don't have to do this, which make up the majority of devotees. And it's not to say necessarily that we denounce our parents <laughs> or other family members. It's that we see everyone as equal, that we realize our divine parents as making us fellow children of every human being, all life forms. But Sriji Maharaj is speaking very directly here. So, after many spiritual endeavors, I emaciated my body so much that if something pierced my body, water would come out, but never blood. In this manner, one who is virtuous can be known from their childhood. Then Bhajananand Swami asked, Maharaj, is it better to maintain such a thought in one's mind, or is it better to expose the body to austerities? To that, Sriji Maharaj said, Some faults are due to the body, they should be known, and some thoughts are due to the mind, they should also be known. Of these, which are the faults of the body? Well, repeated stimulation of the genitive organs and uh, scratching or involuntary touching of the same organs, excessive movement, rapid movement of the eyes, smelling many types of fragrances quickly, <laughs> walking 20 or 25 miles quickly, embracing someone with such force that their bones break, releasing any vital fluid during dreams, and so on. All these are the faults of the body rather than the mind. Even if these faults of the body are greatly reduced, lustful desires, as well as desires for eating, drinking, walking, touching, smelling, hearing, and tasting may remain. So these should be known as the faults of the mind. In this manner, the faults of the body and mind should be distinguished. Then the faults of the body should be removed by imposing bodily restraints. Thereafter, once the body is weakened, the remaining faults of the mind should be eradicated by contemplating. I am the Atma, the true self, separate from desires. In fact, I am completely blissful. One who practices these two methods, bodily restraint and contemplation of the Atma, is a great sadhu. If one has only bodily restraint, but does not contemplate, then it is not appropriate. Conversely, if one only contemplates, but does not restrain the body, then that is also not appropriate. Therefore, one who has both is the best. Restraint and contemplation are necessary for even householder satsangis. To, um, sorry, I skipped a sentence. Therefore, one who has both is the best. Moreover, if these two methods, bodily restraint and contemplation, are necessary for even householder satsangis, participants in the spiritual gathering, to practice, then a renunciant, a monk, should definitely practice them. Then, Nishkulanan Swami asked, Maharaj, can one remain like that through contemplation or through vairagya? Riji Maharaj replied, One remains like that due to the company of a great sadhu. Furthermore, one who is unable to do so even with the company of a great sadhu is a grave sinner. Saying that, Riji Maharaj continued, if a renunciant desires to indulge in the worldly pleasures which are appropriate only for a householder, then they are as good as an animal eating dry grass. Why is that? 
because even though they are never going to acquire those objects, they still harbor a desire for them. It seems then that they have not understood the fact properly, because, as the saying goes, what is the point in asking the name of a village which one is not going to visit? If they do harbor a craving for those objects that they have renounced, will it be possible for them to obtain them during this lifetime? They can only obtain them if they fall from satsang, but not while remaining in satsang. So, one who maintains a desire for those pleasures while remaining in satsang is a fool. Why? Because whoever remains in satsang is required to comply by its injunctions. For example, if a woman sets out to become a sati, sati is a very controversial practice in which a widowed woman throws herself into the funeral pyre that her husband is being, or her late husband is being burdened so that they can uh, go together as one to their next life, I guess. Uh, since the time of writing, there has been a lot of humanitarian effort to ensure that, you know, there are other opportunities available for people who lo lose their husband. They don't have to throw themselves into a fire. There's mental health resources and other ways to ensure that we go through the rituals of blessing the deceased as well as those who have to bear the loss. Nonetheless, Sriji Maharaj is about to make the point that if she sets out to do this, but she changes her mind, then that would be contrary to the vow that she's already undertaken. So I'll just read that sentence again. For example, if a woman sets out to become a sati, but turns back upon seeing the fire, would her relatives allow her to turn back? They would force her to burn on her husband's funeral pyre. Also, if a Brahmin lady becomes a widow, but continues to dress like a married woman, will her relations allow it? Certainly they would not. Thus, one who maintains indecent swabhavs, these uh, deep-seated impressions, while remaining in satsang, has not understood this talk, because if they had understood it, such indecent swabhavs would not remain. Saying this, Sriji Maharaj bid Jai Saminarayan to everyone and departed to go to sleep. Thank you for listening. So yeah, there were some um, unrelated, but, but many uh, difficult themes throughout that passage. Um, it is a beautiful truth, in fact, that uh, since the time of this writing, the Swami Narayan traditions actually have done so much work for the uh, for women's rights and the gender and differences that exist, especially in Indian culture. I believe, actually, Swami Narayan Bhagwan is making the point here that this is not something that they should force. It just happens to be the case that look, we're making an observation that people force people to do things they're already participating in. And there was a lot of love for the, uh, the gender differences from the Swami Narayan tradition. So with that said, I hope I've done my best in conveying this philosophy. Um, I know that much of my audience is Western too. So if you're a Western listener like me, um, these terms can definitely be very foreign, you know, definitely very different. So we have to understand the culture and context uh, in which they were first spoken. And of course, translating to English, it might leave a couple of things to, uh, to question. But nonetheless, there are some very important spiritual truths, uh, even amidst my potential inability to convey them and uh, cultural differences. So thank you very much for listening. I look forward to reading future passages. Jai Swaminarayan.